Welcome to The Complete Musician, creativity at its core, exploring innovative musical ideas, thoughts, and techniques for the modern musician in today's society, with your hosts, James Nagus and Drew Phillips. Welcome to the second episode of our show. Thanks for joining us. It's good to see all of you again. Thanks for joining us on our first full episode of our podcast. And this is the first episode where we have a definite topic, which we'll talk about, and uh, maybe even a special guest later on, so stay tuned to find out. Our topic today is limitations, especially relating to composition. So, James, what is your definition of limitations? Well, music-wise, I don't know. I tend to think of limitations in everyday life things. Like, I don't know, this morning I'm limiting myself to... Only seven cups of coffee. Oh, that's not too bad. I limit myself personally to nine cupcakes a day. Oh, nine cupcakes? I was going to do four Twinkies, but nine cupcakes sounds a little better. Mm, gotcha. What about in everyday life? Do you limit yourself in other ways? Uh, approximately four high fives per day. That's... I will only give out four. That's right. Not three and definitely not five, but four. Absolutely. Yeah. I limit myself to scowling at only 12 strangers a week. That's kind of a negative limitation, I feel. And I don't know, t- limitations tend to have that kind of halt to them where you're, you're putting constraints on something. But I guess, and you'd probably agree, limitations can be used for positive things. It can be used for useful things as well. Absolutely. And especially in the music-making realm, limitations really provide a basis for... Uh, for composition and for things like improvisation to make things easier, especially for those that have never done it before. Well, it's a good point. And when I talk to a lot of people about composition, one of the questions I'll ask is, do you compose? Have you composed before? And the answer I get frequently is, no, I'm not good at it. And to that, I always say, well, how many times have you tried? And that's usually, well, you know, not too much, because um, it's hard, and there's, there's so many choices and so many options I can make. So I think limitations are absolutely the tool for you first-time composition students or um, even us people who have done it a few times um, that really help kind of narrow our focus and get a piece started. I've also had students who, in arranging classes that they've been in, with already given things like note choices and instrumentation find the composition for the first time in their arrangements overwhelming because of the great amount of choices that they have. So narrowing those down, like you said, is very useful and provides a really good basis and foundation for uh, writing for the first time. Now we're throwing this word around quite a bit, this composition word, which I think is now a perfect segue into our first official segment called The Composition Corner! So this is the Composition Corner, spelled with both Ks for alliteration. And this is a segment where we're going to talk about our compositions, about techniques to write music, for you to write music. And the topic of limitations fits perfectly in this because, like we are saying, limitations are the ways to get started and to make a lot of musical decisions about your piece before you even begin. Absolutely. When you start off composing, especially for the first time, all of the choices can be really overwhelming. It's like you're saying, I'm going to write a book, but you have absolutely no topic in mind about what you're going to write your book about. And it's even more daunting with today's technology, because before with paper and pencil, you can write notes and you can choose instrumentation, and it's all essentially realized in your head. But now with MIDI technology and with sound libraries, the choice of instruments that you can pick from is almost infinite, especially with all kinds of electronic sounds. So we're actually going in the opposite direction of we're giving more options and more choices instead of limiting those choices. Like you're saying, there are so many things to choose from before even starting. There's instrumentation, there's key, there's length of the piece, meter, and that's before even note choice comes into play. Uh, Constraints and limitations is really your best ally. It, in my opinion, acts as a guideline or almost a blueprint of the composition that you're trying to start. Or at least it makes a lot of the decisions for you and you just focus on some things, like say you were just, your first piece, this could be, you know, you are picking, say your horn player, you're picking horn, there's your instrument, meter, four, four. Let's do the range of only the notes within an octave. And I don't know, what would be a, a mood or a character? 
sad. A sad piece. Okay, so now we're maybe doing a minor scale. Um, and so now you already have several things. Now maybe determine length. And there you go, there's your first piece. The only thing it needs now is a title, which, I don't know, titles, I'm terrible coming up with titles. I usually just use random word generator on the internet. And then you throw it into a thesaurus and make it sound fancy, and, and there it is. I try and decide and limit my choices before even beginning, and that makes my job easier. And I think the more specific, the better. Uh, our old teacher, Jeff Agrell, who we might be hearing from later, uh, has a quote on one of his blogs, Composition Insights, on the internet that says, specific is always good because there are more limitations, and limitations always make a creator's job easier. I think this idea of limitation is a process that both you and I go through, James, uh, in every composition that we do. It makes it easier on us to create from an etched out plan, and I think we can both agree it's much harder to start from nothing than it is to start from something. And I've found that it really works well for my students, too. I've had several do their first compositions in a similar manner where I laid out the limitations and made all the decisions for them. And, and while the piece itself was maybe not the most aesthetically interesting or varied piece, the bottom line is they were all able to do it because all these choices were made. And once you have the first piece, then writing the second piece, the third piece, the tenth piece, it just comes a lot easier because you've you know, got your foot wet, and you've started writing. So for all those budding composers out there who have never written for the first time and are so scared to do so, which I know I was when I started because of, again, these overwhelming choices, decide from these kind of things when you begin to compose. First, think about your instrumentation. Think about what instruments you're going to be writing for. Think also about the form that you're going to write in. How many sections are you going to write in? Does it follow a classical form like binary, ternary, rondo, or etc.? Another thing to keep in mind is the length. Are you going to compose something that's just a minute long? Are you going to go for something that's even more substantial with more time? In the beginning, writing for a shorter time is going to be a lot easier than writing for a greater amount of time. Another thing to think about is your mode and your key. Where tonally should this go, or where atonally should this sit? Those are all choices you can make before you even start thinking about notes. Choosing your meter is an easy way to decide what kind of feel your piece is going to have. If you want to have a slower, maybe something in 4-4, four, four, or something more upbeat in a compound meter, something like 6-8. The last thing you can think about before you even start are stylistic decisions. Like, does it adhere to a certain style indicated by a tempo or a metronome marking? Or would you like it to fit a certain noun, like march, ballad, hymn, etc.? There are other adjectives that also suggest musical decisions, like reverent, spirited, agitated, flowing, and others. I think the bottom line is that the more specificity you include before you even write any pitches is going to make it that much easier to make your note choices. It gives you a formulated plan to refer to you if you start wondering what you should do next. So for all of you out there who have never written before because you've been too overwhelmed by the vast number of choices, give it a try. Think of all the choices you can make before you even begin writing. And for you teachers out there, go ahead and assign your students a composition as well, using the same guidelines and limitations that we just talked about for your own compositions. And that wraps up our first Composition Corner segment, and stay tuned for our next segment, which is our first interview. And we don't really have a name for this segment yet, um, so what, what do you think it should be called? Uh, creative Colleagues. Oh, that's nice. We're going to call this one Creative Colleagues. Welcome to our first Creative Colleagues segment. Our first guest needs no introduction. It's Jeff Agrell. <laughs> We're going to ask you some questions, and the important thing here is that you only have approximately two minutes to answer each oh, question. Oh no, anything but that. And you'll hear the sound when that two minutes is up, and uh, you can wrap it up. How do I know when the two minutes is up? You'll know. You're going to have a dog's bark, or baby's cry, or... Something close to that. Gunshots, or something. Okay, go. It's like a TED talk on steroids. <laughs> so, right. you got to choose your words carefully. <laughs> 
Okay, first question. What does limitations mean to you in the musical realm? Two minutes, huh? Well, uh, of course, I have improv on the brain, so limitations to me immediately has something to do with, with creative music, either composing or improvisation. And limitations are the doorway, the gateway to creation, because um, if there's any way to make you stop creating, it's to say, do anything you want and have no limitations. And then uh, paralysis sets in because there's too many choices. If you want to, uh, it's much easier to choose from two eggs than 10,000 eggs. So if you set up your limitations, um, that makes it easier to come up with something, either composing or um, improvising. Great. That wasn't even uh, to the two-minute mark. You didn't get to hear the awesome. noise. Awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. No gunshots fired yet. Uh, okay, second question. What are the most important limitations and choices that a beginning composer can make? Uh, a big beginning composer. Uh, well, that's... First thing, uh, if you want to say, how do you get started composing? That might be the, the first question. How do you get started? And the answer is um, start. <laughs> now, well, do something rather than nothing. Um, that means you need a couple things. One is maybe an itch to want to do something and the courage to actually do it because the culture in general uh, uh, works against us creating things because we're worried about making mistakes and uh, if you don't do anything then you don't quote do any mistakes but if you can get over your fear of doing any mistakes then you can do practically anything so start easy make your limitations um, very severe and go for quantity uh, don't worry about anything even being any good just start and say okay I only have four bars and four whole notes is fine or one whole note tied through four bars is fine lower the bar as far as possible and just get started with anything it helps if you have done a lot of listening and you have some uh, what I call compost and that is your um, your experiences in the past things you like to hear things you like to maybe just know how it works, how to figure it out. Um, go from there, try to put it into words, try to put it into the words of music, so to speak. Should a person's first piece be a symphony? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I wouldn't even try to compose anything unless it was the largest piece possible with full choir, <laughs> um, boys choir, um, Russian uh, men's choir. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's the duck. Uh, yeah. No. Start small. Lower the bar as far as possible if you haven't done it before. Uh, it Really, the only thing that matters is just doing stuff. Think of babies. You don't insist that the first thing they say is the Gettysburg Address. Uh, you say they get to go goo goo gaga for a long time. And... Try to, you know, if they don't like something, they cry. And if they do like something, they laugh. And that's pretty pretty simple choices. And we can do the same thing when we compose or improvise. Just do something, something, anything. Not worry about if it's any good, full of mistakes, anything. Just do something and say, okay, what just happened? What can I learn from that? And then you do something else and learn from the first thing. And the second thing is going to be, a little different, maybe a little better, but we're not worry, really worrying about better. Better will take care of itself. Quality comes with quantity and paying attention. All right, and our next thing is a bunch of rapid-fire questions. So you'll have about mm, five to ten seconds to figure up an answer for these, and they are all music-related. So with that, the first one is describe yourself in three words. <laughs> Today, <laughs> um, passionate, enthusiastic, and high tolerance for looking foolish. So that's one word. 
If you had a yacht, what would you name it? Red. <laughs> what is the best advantage to being really tall? You get to look down on everyone. What current fad do you just not understand? Uh, anything anyone does that's under the age of 22. What is your least favorite beverage? This sounds like the actor studio. Um, Brussels sprout soda. What is one thing you own that you wish you didn't? Uh, maybe six fewer guitars. What is your number one karaoke song? Melancholy Baby. What is your least favorite chore to do around the house? Scrub floors. On a scale of 1 to 10, how cool are you? Uh, what time of day? All day. Uh, Every day. Morning, about 3.5. Um, yeah, it's pretty much 3.5 all day, I guess. A uh, penguin walks into the room wearing a sombrero right now. What does he say, and why is he here? He says, you're asking for a Spanish teacher. I'm not, not sure you can afford me, but um, uh, let's, let's negotiate. And finally, you've been given an elephant. You can't trade it or sell it. What are three things you do with it and why? Teach it to eat grass so I don't have to mow the damn grass anymore. Uh, prune the trees at the same time. And uh, um, frighten away bullies. <laughs> Those are awesome answers. Thank you for answering our serious and kind of stupid questions. <laughs> yeah, and thanks for joining us on our first uh, full podcast episode. My pleasure. I hope, colleagues. I hope you do this 10,000 more times. Uh, now is your chance to plug anything you want. Go for it. Book one, buy my technique book, Amazon.com. Do it. Born technique. Book two, not out yet, September, The Creative Hornist, which uh, kind of goes along with your podcast here. Um, doing all those things your mother told you never to do uh, with your horn. Um, no, not exactly. Um, different ways to use your horn that are not necessarily described in the first book. So um, I'd, uh, this, if you buy all my books, be the first one on your block to get them then I can retire to the style to which I'd like to become accustomed. And that'll wrap up our first interview segment. We'd like to thank Jeff Agrell again for coming on the show and chatting with us. And we'd like to thank you for listening. And as a reminder, if you have any comments, questions, complaints, recipes you want to share, feel free to contact us at coremotohorn at gmail.com or just leave a comment in the comment section below. Take care, and remember what Plato once said, be the change that you want to see in the viola section.